Lewis's Medical Surgical Nursing, 11th edition, Chapter 14, Infection. This chapter presents a brief overview of the concept of emerging and healthcare-associated infections, HAIs. This includes identifying persons most at risk, recognizing signs and symptoms of infection, and understanding ways to treat or manage infection. Infection, immunity, and inflammation are closely related. Infection stimulates an inflammatory response and affects thermoregulation. The patient may have fatigue and pain. Maintaining adequate nutrition and rest is important to combating infection and supporting immune function. The chapter closes with a comprehensive discussion of human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, infection, focusing on transmission, pathophysiology, and interprofessional and nursing management. Infections. Infections, such as lower respiratory tract infections, malaria, HIV, and tuberculosis, TB, are responsible for a significant number of deaths worldwide. Infection occurs when a pathogen, a microorganism that causes disease, invades the body, multiplies, and produces disease, usually causing harm to the host. The signs and symptoms of infection are a result of specific pathogen activity, which triggers inflammation and other immune responses. We categorize infections as localized, disseminated, or systemic. A localized infection is limited to a small area. A disseminated infection has spread to areas of the body beyond the initial site of infection. Systemic infections have spread extensively throughout the body, often via the blood. Types of pathogens. The many kinds of pathogens are classified into several groups, including bacteria, viruses, fungi, protozoa, and prions. Bacteria are one-celled organisms that are common throughout nature. Many bacteria are normal flora. They live harmoniously in or on the human body without causing disease under normal circumstances. Normal flora protect the human body by preventing the overgrowth of other microorganisms. For example, Escherichia coli is part of the normal flora in the large intestine. Bacteria cause disease in two ways, by entering the body and growing inside human cells, e.g. TB, or by secreting toxins that damage cells, e.g. Staphylococcus aureus. Bacteria are classified based on the shape of their cells. Coxi such as streptococci and staphylococci, are round. Bacilli are rod-shaped and include tetanus and TB. Curved rods include vibrio bacteria, one of which causes cholera. Spirochets are spiral-shaped. They include the organisms that cause leprosy and syphilis. Table 14.1 lists common bacteria that cause disease. Viruses, unlike bacteria, do not have a cellular structure. They are simple infectious particles that consist of a small amount of genetic material, either ribonucleic acid, RNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA, and a protein envelope. Viruses can reproduce only after releasing their genetic material into the cell of another living organism. Examples of diseases caused by viruses are shown in Table 14.2. Fungi are organisms similar to plants, but they lack chlorophyll. Mycosis is any disease caused by a fungus. Pathogenic fungi cause infections that are usually localized but can become disseminated in an immunocompromised person. Tinea pedis, athlete's foot, and Tinea corporis, ringworm, are common mycotic infections. Some fungi are normal flora in the body, but when overgrowth occurs, diseases can result. Overgrowth of Candida albicans, for example, can cause candidiasis in the mouth, thrush, esophagus, intestines, and vagina. Table 14.3 lists other fungi and their respective mycotic infections. Protozoa are single-cell, animal-like microorganisms. Protozoa normally live in soil and bodies of water. 
when introduced into the human body, they can cause infection. Protozoal parasites cause amoebic dysentery and gyardiasis. A sporozoan called plasmodium malariae causes malaria. Prions are infectious particles that have abnormally shaped proteins. Not all prions cause disease. Those that do typically affect the nervous system. They can cause a group of illnesses called transmissible spongiform encephalopathies, TSEs. Examples of TSEs are Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease and bovine spongiform encephalopathy in cattle, also known as mad cow disease. Emerging infections. An emerging infection is an infectious disease that has recently increased in incidence or that threatens to increase in the immediate future. Table 14.4 lists examples of emerging infections. Emerging infectious diseases can originate from unknown sources or from contact with animals, changes in known diseases or biologic warfare. For example, severe acute respiratory syndrome, SARS, and the Ebola virus come from animal sources. Others emerged when a previously treatable organism developed resistance to antibiotics. The battle against infection is not new, but modern technologies have changed the rules of the game. Global travel, population density, encroachment into new environments, misuse of antibiotics, and bioterrorism have increased the risk for widespread distribution of emerging infections. Additionally, some diseases thought to be under control, such as TB, measles, and pertussis, have reemerged. Newer infections include Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome, MERS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, SARS, Zika virus, and zoonotic influenza viruses, e.g. H1N1 and H5N1. Studies in zoonosis, science of transmission of diseases from animals to humans, have shown that many known infectious diseases come from animal and insect vectors. The SARS outbreak in China in 2003, for, for instance, was linked to the civet cat, a small carnivorous mammal found throughout much of Asia and Africa. SARS is discussed in Chapter 67. West Nile virus is carried and transmitted by mosquitoes. Mosquitoes acquire the virus as they draw blood from infected animals and humans. The virus does not cause illness in the mosquito. The mosquito transfers the virus to uninfected animals and humans when it feeds. Bird deaths are an early warning sign of West Nile virus outbreak, which can spread quickly if action is not taken promptly. West Nile virus is discussed in Chapter 56. Influenza viruses are examples of how disease can spread between animals and humans. Variants of influenza A viruses are responsible for many influenza epidemics. We traced the 2009 influenza A, H1N1, outbreak back to pigs, hence the name swine flu. In 1997 and 2003, outbreaks of the influenza A, H5N1 strain of avian flu, resulted from transmission of influenza virus from chickens to humans. Ebola virus has been an ongoing public health challenge since it was first seen in 1976. In 2014, rates of Ebola increased significantly in East Africa, and the first cases of Ebola occurred in the United States. These initial cases were primarily from travelers or medical aid workers who were working in Africa. Ebola virus can cause severe hemorrhagic fever and is usually lethal. Therapeutic and preventative measures are limited. The natural reservoir and path of transmission are unknown, which makes it impossible to effectively combat Ebola virus and the disease it causes. Reemerging infections. Advances in the development of medications and vaccines has led to the near eradication of some infections, e.g. smallpox, polio. 
but infective agents can reemerge under the right conditions. Table 14.5 presents some diseases that have shown resurgence in recent decades. For example, infections such as measles and pertussis have had sporadic resurgences. This is in part due to people not receiving recommended vaccines. International travel has created a new obstacle for the local eradication of diseases. For example, measles is no longer endemic in the United States, but it is still a leading cause of death in developing countries. Domestic outbreaks have typically occurred in areas with low vaccination rates. Some cases occurred in people who have recently traveled to measles endemic areas outside the United States. Antimicrobial resistant organisms. Resistance occurs when pathogenic organisms change in ways that decrease the ability of a drug or family of drugs to treat disease. Microorganisms can become resistant to classic treatments, e.g. penicillin, as well as to newer antibiotics and antiviral agents. Microorganisms are highly adaptable. They have evolved genetic and biochemical mechanisms to defend against antimicrobials. Genetic mechanisms include mutation and acquisition of new DNA or RNA. Biochemically, bacteria can resist antibiotics by producing enzymes that destroy or inactivate the drugs. Drug target sites are then altered so that the antibiotic cannot bind to or enter the bacteria. If the drug cannot enter the cell, it cannot kill the bacteria. Table 14.6 describes common antibiotic resistant bacteria. Methicillin resistant S. aureus, MRSA, vancomycin resistant Enterococci, VRE, vancomycin resistant S. aureus, VRSA, carbapenem resistant Enterobacteria, CA, CRE, and penicillin resistant Streptococcus pneumoniae are examples of emerging strains of antibiotic resistant organisms. These drug-resistant bacteria were first seen in healthcare settings, but are becoming more prevalent in the community. For example, we initially considered MRSA a form of S. aureus that does not respond to methicillin or penicillin-based therapies, a healthcare-associated infection, HAMRSA. However, a variant strain of MRSA that is primarily acquired in the community community-acquired MRSA, or CA MRSA, has emerged. This strain of MRSA is more virulent, able to cause disease or infection, compared with HA MRSA. CA MRSA can cause rapidly forming skin infections and systemic diseases, including pneumonia and sepsis. VRE infection is another concern for patients and healthcare workers. VRE are more virulent than MRSA and can survive in environmental surfaces for weeks. Although antibiotic-resistant bacteria can infect anyone, hospitalized patients and those with a suppressed immune system are more likely to be exposed to these bacteria and to develop infection. HCPs have contributed to the development of drug-resistant microorganisms by one, giving antibiotics for viral infections, to succumbing to patient pressure to prescribe unnecessary antibiotic therapy, three, using inadequate drug regimens to treat infections, or four, using broad spectrum or combination agents for infections that should be treated with first-line medications. Patients can contribute to resistance development by one, skipping doses, two, not taking antibiotics for the full duration of prescribed therapy, or three, saving unused antibiotics, quote, in case I need them later. In addition, limited resources and access to medications make it hard for some patients to get adequate treatment for infections. Teaching patients and their families the proper use of antibiotics, table 14.7, is crucial to treatment success and prevention of drug-resistant pathogens. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, 
the Infectious Diseases Society of America, and many healthcare organizations campaign for greater vigilance in minimizing the misuse of antibiotics in reaction to this growing concern. Although antibiotics are a class of drugs that we typically think of when discussing drug-resistant organisms, any organism, virus, fungi, parasite, can develop drug resistance to agents typically used to treat them. Hence, we now use the term antimicrobial resistance to describe the phenomena of resistance across different classes of organisms. Healthcare-associated infections are infections that are acquired because of exposure to microorganisms in a healthcare setting. About 722,000 HAIs occur annually, and nearly one in every 25 hospitalized patients has at least one HAI. Improvements in infection control have resulted in fewer infections in recent years. We have seen decreases in several of the major types of HAIs, including central line-associated bloodstream infections, surgical site infections, Clostridium difficile infections, and methicillin-resistant SRES bacteremia. Any organism ca uh, can cause HAIs, but certain bacteria, including E. coli, S. aureus, Enterobacter aerogenes, and various types of Streptococci, are the more common culprits. Some bacteria that do not normally cause disease can cause infections in high-risk patients because of illness or treatment of illness. Surgical and immunocompromised patients are at highest risk. Around one-third of HAIs are preventable. HCPs often transmit HAIs from patient to patient through direct contact. First lines of defense to prevent the spread of HAIs include hand washing or using an alcohol-based hand sanitizer before and after patient contact or procedures. Appropriate use of personal protective equipment such as gloves and decontamination of equipment used for patient care. Isolated infections also can be caused when bacteria that normally stay in one area of the body are introduced into another area. Therefore, you must take care to change gloves and wash hands when moving from one task to another, even when working with the same patient. Most facilities have developed and implemented guidelines on reducing and controlling the spread of disease in healthcare settings, especially of antimicrobial resistant organisms, Table 14.8. Nurses and all HCPs have the responsibility of using appropriate measures, including transmission-based precautions to help protect patients from HAIs. Gerontologic considerations, infections in older adults. For older adults, the rate of HAIs is two to three times higher compared to younger patients. Persons in long-term care facilities are at a higher risk of HAI. Age-related changes, e.g. impaired immune function, and comorbidities such as diabetes and physical disabilities contribute to higher infection rates in older adults. Infections common in older adults include pneumonia, urinary tract infections, UTIs, skin infections, and TB. UTIs are more common in those who live in long-term care facilities. Patients with indwelling catheters are at particular risk. Infections in older adults often have atypical manifestations such as cognitive and behavioral changes before the emergence of fever, pain, or changes in laboratory values. Do not rely on the presence of fever to indicate infection in older adults, because many have lower core body temperatures and decreased immune responses. Suspicion of disease should typically begin if a patient shows changes in the ability to perform daily activities or in cognitive function. In addition, underlying diseases, increased frequency of drug reactions, and institutionalization can complicate the management of an older adult with infection. Infection Prevention and Control Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, Guidelines OSHA is a federal agency that protects workers from injury and illness in places of employment and supports activities that minimize or eliminate exposure to infectious materials in the workplace. OSHA mandates that any employer whose employees could be exposed to potentially infectious materials implement standard policy and procedures to protect those employees. Employees must be provided with appropriate PPE and safety equipment at no cost to the employee. These include gloves, gowns, facial protection, and disposal system for sharps, table 14.8. PPE also must be provided in the right sizes. 
Hypoallergenic gloves or similar alternatives must be made available to those who have an allergic sensitivity to gloves. Appropriate PPE varies depending on the situation. You need to use sound judgment when deciding when and how to use protective equipment. Infection precautions. The CDC has established guidelines with two levels of precautions. One, standard precautions designed for the care of all patients in hospitals and healthcare facilities. And two, transmission-based precautions designed for specific diseases. The purpose of these precautions is to prevent the transmission of organisms from patients to HCPs, from HCPs to patients, from patients to other patients, and from healthcare personnel and patients to people outside the hospital. Table 14.9. The standard precaution system applies to 1. Blood, 2. All body fluid secretions and excretions, 3. Non-intact skin, and 4. Mucous membrane. Standard precautions are designed to reduce the risk for transmission of microorganisms in hospitals. Standard precautions should be applied to all patients, regardless of diagnosis or presumed infection status. The CDC's standard precautions incorporate all the OSHA bloodborne pathogen standard requirements. Transmission-based precautions are used for patients known to be or suspected of being infected, with highly transmissible or epidemiologically important pathogens that require additional precautions to interrupt transmission and prevent infection. Transmission-based precautions include airborne precautions, droplet precautions, and contact precautions. Airborne precautions are used if the organism can cause infection over long distances when suspended in the air, e.g. TB, rubiola. Droplet precautions minimize contact with pathogens that spread through the air at close contact and that affect the respiratory system or mucous membranes, e.g. influenza, pertussis. Contact precautions minimize the spread of pathogens that are acquired from direct or indirect contact, especially multi-drug resistant organisms, e.g. MRSA, VRE, CRE. Transmission-based precautions may be combined for diseases that have multiple routes of transmission. Whether used alone or in combination, transmission-based precautions should always be used in conjunction with standard precautions. Human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, is a retrovirus that causes immunosuppression. Persons with HIV are more susceptible to infections that people normally control through immune responses. The terms HIV disease and HIV infection are used interchangeably. With advances in treatment, we view HIV as a chronic disease since people with the disease are living longer. More than 1 million people are currently living with HIV in the United States, with about 37,600 new infections occurring each year. With the availability of effective HIV treatment, there has been a dramatic drop in the number of deaths attributable to HIV. In North America, HIV is most prevalent among men who have sex with men, MSM. Transmission of HIV. HIV can be transmitted through contact with infected blood, semen, vaginal secretions, or breast milk. HIV transmission occurs through sexual intercourse with an infected partner, exposure to HIV-infected blood or blood products, and perinatal transmission during pregnancy, at delivery, or through breastfeeding. HIV is not spread casually. The virus cannot be transmitted through hugging, dry kissing, shaking hands, sharing eating utensils, using toilet seats, or casual encounters in any setting. It is not spread by tears, saliva, urine, emesis, sputum, feces, sweat, respiratory droplets, or enteric routes. Healthcare personnel have a low risk for acquiring HIV at work, even after a needle stick injury. Sexual transmission. The most common mode of HIV transmission is unprotected sexual contact with an HIV infected partner. Sexual activity involves contact with semen, vaginal secretions, and or blood, all of which have lymphocytes that may contain HIV. During any form of sexual intercourse, anal, vaginal, oral, the risk for infection is greater for the partner who receives the semen. This is because the receiver has prolonged contact with the infected fluids. It helps explain why it is easier to infect women than men 
during heterosexual intercourse. Sexual activities that cause trauma to local tissues can increase the risk for transmission. In addition, genital lesions from other sexually transmitted infections, e.g. herpes syphilis, significantly increase the chance of transmission. Contact with blood and blood products. HIV can be transmitted from exposure to blood when sharing drug using paraphernalia. Needles, syringes, straws, and other equipment may be contaminated with HIV or other blood-borne organisms. Sharing this equipment can result in disease transmission. Routine screening of blood donors to identify at-risk persons and testing donated blood for the presence of HIV have improved the safety of the blood supply. In countries that routinely test donated blood, HIV infection because of blood transfusions or hemophilia clotting factors is unlikely. Puncture wounds are the most common means of work-related HIV transmission. The risk for infection after a needle stick exposure to HIV-infected blood is 0.3% to 0.4%, or 3 or 4 out of 1,000. The risk is higher if the exposure involves blood from a patient with a high level of circulating HIV. A deep puncture wound, a needle with a hollow bore and visible blood, or a device used for venous or arterial access. Splash exposures of blood on skin with an open lesion present, present some risk, but it is much lower than from a puncture wound. Perinatal transmission. Perinatal transmission from an HIV-infected mother to her infant can occur during pregnancy, delivery, or breastfeeding. On average, 25% of infants born to women with untreated HIV infection are born with HIV. Fortunately, the risk for transmission is less than 2% in settings in which pregnant women are routinely tested for HIV infection and, if found to be infected, treated with antiretroviral therapy, ART, a combination of medications used to control and suppress HIV replication. Pathophysiology. HIV is an RNA virus. RNA viruses are called retroviruses because they replicate in a backward manner, going from RNA to DNA. Like all viruses, HIV cannot replicate unless it is inside a living cell. The CD4 plus T cell, CD4 cell, a type of lymphocyte, is the target cell for HIV. HIV enters the CD4 cell by binding to protein receptors on the outside of the cell, figure 14.1. This process is known as fusion, figure 14.2. Once HIV is attached and fused with the CD4 cell, HIV RNA enters the CD4 cell. This triggers the release of reverse transcriptase, an enzyme that transforms HIV RNA into a single strand of DNA. This strand copies itself, becoming double-stranded viral DNA. Another enzyme called integrase allows the newly formed double-stranded DNA to integrate itself into the host's genetic structure. This action has two consequences. One, because all genetic material is replicated during cell division, all daughter cells are infected and two, viral DNA in the genome directs the cell to make new HIV. Protease, another enzyme involved in the replication process, cleaves the newly formed strands of HIV genetic material into smaller pieces. New HIV virons are then formed and released. The CD4 cell is then destroyed after the HIV virons are released. HIV destroys about 1 billion CD4 cells every day. For many years, the body can make new CD4 cells to replace the destroyed cells. However, over time, the ability of HIV to destroy CD4 cells exceeds the body's ability to replace the cells. The decline in the CD4 cell count impairs immune function. 
Generally, the immune system remains healthy with more than 500 CD4 cells per microliter. Immune problems begin to occur when the count drops below 500 CD4 cells per microliter. Severe problems develop with fewer than 200 CD4 cells per microliter. With HIV, a point is eventually reached at which so many CD4 cells have been destroyed that not enough are left to regulate immune responses, figure 14.3. This allows opportunistic diseases, infections and cancers that occur in immunosuppressed patients, to develop. Opportunistic diseases are the main cause of disease, disability, and death in patients with HIV infection. Clinical manifestations and complications. The typical course of untreated HIV infection follows the pattern shown in figure 14.4. It's important to remember that one, disease progression is highly individualized, two, treatment can significantly alter this pattern, and three, a person's prognosis is unpredictable. Acute infection. About two to four weeks after someone becomes newly infected with HIV, the person typically develops acute HIV infection. During this period, the person can have a mononucleosis-like syndrome of fever, swollen lymph nodes, sore throat, headache, malaise, nausea, muscle and joint pain, diarrhea, and or a diffuse rash. Some people have neurologic complications, such as aseptic meningitis, peripheral neuropathy, facial palsy, or Guillain-Barre syndrome. During this time, there is a high viral load, the amount of HIV circulating in the blood. CD4 cell counts fall temporarily, but quickly return to baseline or near baseline levels, figure 14.3. Many people, including HCPs, mistake acute HIV symptoms for a bad case of the flu. People are most infectious during the acute infection stage because of the high amounts of circulating HIV. Chronic HIV infection. Asymptomatic infection. The time between initial HIV infection and a diagnosis of AIDS is about 10 years in untreated infection. During the first several years after initial infection, people are typically asymptomatic and have no symptoms or limited signs of infection. Because most symptoms during early infection are vague and nonspecific for HIV, people may not be aware that they are infected. During this time, infected people continue their usual activities, which may include high-risk sexual and drug-using behaviors. This is a public health problem because infected persons can transmit HIV to others even though they have no symptoms. Personal health is also affected because people who do not know that they are infected have little reason to seek treatment and are less likely to make behavior changes that can improve the quality and length of their lives. Symptomatic infection. As the CD4 cell count declines closer to 200 cells per microliter and the viral load increases, HIV advances to a more active stage. Symptoms such as persistent fever, frequent night sweats, chronic diarrhea, recurrent headaches, and severe fatigue may develop. One of the more common infections associated with this phase of HIV infection is oropharyngeal candidiasis, thrush, figure 14.5. Candida organisms rarely cause problems in healthy adults, but are more common in HIV-infected people. Other infections that can occur at this time include shingles caused by varicella zoster virus, persistent vaginal candidal infections, outbreaks of oral or genital herpes, bacterial infections, and Kaposi sarcoma, KS, caused by human herpes virus 8, figure 14.6. Oral hairy leukoplakia, an Epstein-Barr virus infection that causes painful, white, raised lesions on the lateral aspect of the tongue, figure 14.7, is another sign of disease progression. AIDS. A diagnosis of acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, AIDS, is made when an HIV-infected patient meets criteria established by the CDC. 
This occurs when the immune system becomes severely compromised. Table 14.10. Opportunistic diseases generally do not occur in the presence of a functioning immune system. Many infections of a variety of cancers, wasting, and HIV-related cognitive changes can occur in patients with immune impairment. Table 14.11. Organisms that do not cause severe disease in people with functioning immune systems can cause debilitating, life-threatening infections during this stage. Several opportunistic diseases may occur at the same time, increasing the difficulties of diagnosis and treatment. Advances in HIV treatment have decreased the occurrence of opportunistic diseases. Diagnostic Studies Diagnosis of HIV Infection Diagnosis of HIV infection is made by testing for HIV antibodies and or antigens. HIV screening tests can be done using blood or saliva. Typically, it takes several weeks after infection before a screening test can detect evidence of HIV. Figure 14.3. This delay is known as the window period. The typical window period for most tests to detect HIV infection is about three weeks. Table 14.12. If a newly infected person is tested during the window period, the test may not be able to detect infection and they will have a false negative result. Laboratory studies in HIV infection. Two laboratory tests are used for monitoring HIV progression, CD4 cell count and viral load. The CD4 cell count is a marker of immune function. As the disease progresses, the number of CD4 cells usually decreases, figure 14.3. The normal range for CD4 cells is 800 to 1200 cells per microliter. Laboratory tests that measure viral levels provide an assessment of disease progression. The lower the viral load, the less active the disease. In HIV, viral loads are reported as real numbers, e.g. 1,260 copies per microliter. The goal of treatment is to suppress the viral load to the lowest possible level, which is below the level of detection on a commercial assay. This is often referred to as undetectable. Undetectable does not mean that the virus has been eliminated from the body or that the person can no longer transmit HIV to others. Rather, it refers to the fact that the amount of circulating HIV in the blood is below the level of detection of the test. Abnormal blood test results are common in HIV infection. They may be caused by HIV, opportunistic diseases, or complications of therapy. Decreased white blood cell, WBC, counts, especially below normal numbers of lymphocytes, lymphopenia, and neutrophils, neutropenia, often occur. HIV antiplatelet antibodies or drug therapy can cause low platelet counts, thrombocytopenia. Anemia is associated with the chronic disease process and adverse effects of ART. Altered liver function caused by HIV infection, drug therapy, or co-infection with a hepatitis virus is common. Early identification of co-infection with hepatitis B virus, HBV, or hepatitis C virus, HCV, is extremely important. These infections have a more serious course in patients with HIV, may limit options for ART, and can cause liver-related morbidity and mortality. Resistance tests can determine if a patient's HIV is resistant to drugs used for ART. Genotype and phenotype assays help HCPs know which medications can best control a patient's infection. These tests are similar to culture and sensitivity testing used for antibiotic selection. Interprofessional care. Interprofessional care of the HIV-infected patient focuses on, one, monitoring HIV disease progression and immune function, two, initiating and monitoring ART, three, preventing the development of opportunistic diseases, four, detecting and treating opportunistic diseases, five, managing symptoms, six, preventing or decreasing complications of treatment, 
and seven, preventing further transmission of HIV. To achieve these goals, ongoing assessment, clinician-patient interactions, and patient teaching and support are needed. The first patient visit provides an opportunity to gather baseline data and start establishing rapport. A complete history and physical examination, including an immunization history and psychosocial and dietary evaluations, should be done. Findings from the history, assessment, and laboratory tests help determine patient needs. This is a good time to complete the case reports required by the state health department. Initiate patient teaching about the spectrum of HIV disease, treatment, prevention of transmission to others, improvements in health and family planning at this meeting. Use patient input to develop a plan of care and determine the need for referrals. Remember that a newly diagnosed patient may not be able to retain and understand information. Be prepared to repeat and clarify information over the course of several months. Drug therapy for HIV infection. The goals of drug therapy in HIV infection are to, one, decrease the viral load, two, maintain or increase CD4 cell counts, three, prevent HIV-related symptoms and opportunistic diseases, four, delay di disease progression, and five, prevent HIV transmission. HIV cannot be cured, but ART can delay disease progression by decreasing viral replication. When taken consistently and correctly, ART can reduce viral loads by 90% to 99%. This makes adherence to treatment regimens extremely important. Drugs used to treat HIV work at various points in the HIV replication cycle, tables 14.13 and 14.14. The major advantage of using drugs from different classes is that combination therapy can inhibit viral replication in different ways. This makes it more difficult for the virus to recover and decreases the chances of drug resistance. A major problem with most drugs used in ART is that resistance develops rapidly when they are used alone, monotherapy, or taken in inadequate doses. This is why patients receive combinations of three or more drugs. Drug therapy for opportunistic diseases. Management of HIV is complicated by the many opportunistic diseases that can develop as the immune system deteriorates, table 14.11. Prevention is the preferred approach to opportunistic diseases. Several opportunistic diseases associated with HIV can be delayed or prevented with adequate ART. Vaccines, including hepatitis B, influenza, pneumococcal, and disease-specific prevention measures. Although it is usually not possible to eradicate opportunistic diseases once they occur, prophylactic medications can significantly decrease morbidity and mortality rates. Advances in the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of opportunistic diseases have contributed significantly to increased life expectancy. Preventing transmission of HIV. Free exposure prophylaxis, PrEP, is a comprehensive HIV prevention strategy to reduce the risk for sexually acquired HIV infection in adults at high risk. PrEP should be used in conjunction with other proven prevention interventions, such as condoms, risk reduction counseling, and regular HIV testing. Currently, certain antiretrovirals are approved for both treatment of HIV in persons living with HIV, as well as prevention of HIV infection in persons without HIV infection. Various formulations have been studied for PrEP. The first medications approved for PrEP were tenofovir, disoproxyl, fumarate, tenofovir DF, in combination with emtricitabine. Other medications, including injectable options, will soon be available. As PrEP, these medications reduce the risk for HIV infection in uninfected people who are at significant risk for acquiring HIV. Tenofovir and emtricitabine are also used in combination with other antiretroviral agents for the treatment of HIV-infected people. Nursing management, HIV infection, nursing assessment, 
nursing assessment of people not known to have HIV infection should focus on behaviors that put the person at risk for HIV and other sexually transmitted and bloodborne infections. Assess patients for risky behaviors on a regular basis. Do not assume that someone is without risk because he or she is too old, too young, heterosexual, or married. Assess risk by asking some basic questions. One, have you ever had a blood transfusion or used clotting factors? If so, was it before 1985? Two, have you ever shared drug using equipment with another person? Three, have you ever had a sexual experience in which your penis, vagina, rectum, or mouth came into contact with another person's penis, vagina, rectum, or mouth? Four, have you ever had a sexually transmitted infection? Five, have you ever had sexual contact with someone known to have HIV? These questions provide the minimum information needed to initiate a risk assessment. Follow up a positive response to any of these questions with an in-depth exploration of issues related to the identified risk. A person who has HIV infection needs specific ongoing assessment. Subjective and objective data are outlined in Table 14.5. Repeated nursing assessments over time are essential because people's circumstances change. Early recognition and treatment can slow the progression of HIV infection and prevent new infections. A complete history and thorough systems review can help identify and address problems in a timely manner. Nursing diagnoses. Nursing diagnoses for the patient with HIV disease may include risk for infection, lack of knowledge, difficulty coping, impaired nutritional status. Planning. Nursing interventions can help the patient, one, adhere to drug regimens, two, adopt a healthy lifestyle that includes avoiding exposure to other sexually transmitted infections and bloodborne diseases, three, protect others from HIV, four, maintain or develop healthy and supportive relationships, five, maintain activities and productivity, six, explore spiritual issues, seven, come to terms with issues related to disease, disability, and death, and eight, cope with symptoms caused by HIV and its treatments. Nursing implementation. The complexity of HIV disease is related to its chronic nature. As with most chronic and infectious diseases, primary prevention and health promotion are the most effective healthcare strategies. When prevention fails, disease results. Table 14.15 shows a summary of nursing goals, assessments, and interventions throughout the course of HIV infection. Health promotion. Even with recent success in HIV treatment, prevention is key in controlling the epidemic. In addition, health promotion encourages early detection of the disease so that if primary prevention has failed, early intervention can be initiated. Prevention of HIV infection. HIV infection is preventable. Avoiding or modifying risky behaviors is the most effective prevention tool. Nursing interventions to prevent disease transmission are based on assessment of the person's risk behaviors. Provide culturally sensitive, language appropriate, and age-specific teaching and behavior change counseling. Nurses who are comfortable with and know how to talk about sensitive topics, such as sexuality and drug use, are best prepared to provide prevention education. A wide variety of activities can reduce the risk for HIV infection. Help people choose the methods that best fit their needs and circumstances. Prevention techniques are divided into safe sexual activities, those that eliminate risk, and risk-reducing sexual activities, those that decrease but do not eliminate risk. The goal is to develop safer, healthier, and less risky behaviors. The more consistently and correctly one uses prevention methods, the more effective they are in preventing HIV infection. It is a good idea to use a combination of prevention methods, e.g. using condoms, decreasing the number of sex partners, to increase the prevention effort. Decreasing risks related to sexual intercourse. Safe sexual activities eliminate the risk for exposure to HIV in semen and vaginal secretions. Abstaining from all sexual activity 
is an effective way to achieve this goal, but there are safe options for those who cannot or do not wish to abstain. Limiting sexual behavior to activities in which the mouth, penis, vagina, or rectum does not come into contact with a partner's mouth, penis, vagina, or rectum eliminates contact with blood, semen, or vaginal secretions. Safe activities include masturbation, mutual masturbation, quote, hand job, and other activities that meet the no contact requirements. Insertive sex between partners who are not infected with HIV and not at risk of becoming infected with HIV is considered safe. Risk reducing sexual activities decrease the risk of contact with HIV through the use of barriers. Barriers should be used when engaging in insertive sexual activity, oral, vaginal, anal, with a partner who has HIV or whose HIV status is not known. The most commonly used barrier is the male condom. Male condoms offer protection during anal, vaginal, and oral intercourse. Female condoms are an alternative to male condoms. Squares of latex, known as dental dams, can be used as a barrier during oral sexual activity. Decreasing risks related to drug use. Drug use, including alcohol and tobacco, can cause immunosuppression, poor nutrition, and a host of psychosocial problems. However, drug use does not cause HIV infection. The major risk for HIV related to using drugs involves sharing equipment or having unsafe sexual experiences while under the influence of drugs. Basic risk reduction rules are 1. Do not use drugs. 2. If you use drugs, do not share equipment. and 3. Do not have sexual intercourse when under the influence of any drug, including alcohol, that impairs decision making. The safest method to, is to abstain from drugs, but this may not be a practical option for users who are not prepared to quit or have no access to drug treatment services. The risk for HIV infection for those persons is eliminated if they do not share equipment. Injecting equipment, quote, works, including needles, syringes, cookers, spoons or bottle caps used to mix a drug, cotton, and rinse water. Blood can contaminate equipment used to snort, straws, or smoke, pipes, drugs, and should not be shared. Access to sterile equipment is an important risk elimination tactic. Some communities have needle and syringe exchange program, NSEPs, that provide sterile equipment in exchange for used equipment. Opposition to these programs is related to the fear that access to injecting supplies will increase drug use. However, studies have shown that in communities with NSCPs, drug use does not increase, rates of HIV and other blood-borne infections are controlled, and an overall cost-benefit results. Appropriately cleaning equipment before use can reduce risk by decreasing the chance of blood contact. Providing support for patients with substance use and referring them to professionals who can assist with managing the psychologic aspects of substance abuse is important. Other self-help programs, e.g. Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, may be helpful. Decreasing risks of perinatal transmission. The best way to prevent HIV infection in infants is to prevent HIV infection in women. Women infected with HIV should be asked about their reproductive desires. Those who choose not to have children need to have family planning methods discussed in detail. Should they become pregnant, we need to discuss their options, including the possibility of maintaining the pregnancy and using ART to decrease the risk for transmission or having an abortion. If HIV-infected pregnant women are appropriately treated during pregnancy, the rate of perinatal transmission decreases from 25% to less than 2%. ART has significantly decreased the risk for infants born to HIV-infected women, and more of these women are now becoming mothers. The current standard of care is for all women who are pregnant or contemplating pregnancy to receive HIV counseling, 
be offered access to voluntary HIV antibody testing, and if infected, offered optimal ART. Decreasing risks at work. The risk for infection from occupational exposure to HIV is small but real. OSHA requires employers to protect workers from exposure to blood and other potentially infectious materials. Table 14.8. Precautions and safety devices decrease the risk for direct contact with blood and body fluids. Should exposure to HIV-infected fluids occur, post-exposure prophylaxis, PEP, with combination ART can significantly decrease the risk for infection. The need for timely treatment and counseling makes it critical for nurses to report all blood exposures. HIV testing. An estimated 14% of people living with HIV in the United States are not aware that they are infected. People who do not know that they are infected are more likely to transmit the infection to others. Current guidelines recommend universal, voluntary testing as part of routine medical care. The goal is to normalize the test, decrease the stigma related to HIV testing, find hidden cases, get infected persons into care, and prevent new cases of infection. Acute care. Early intervention. Early intervention after detection of HIV infection can promote health and limit disability. The nursing assessment in HIV disease should focus on early detection of symptoms, opportunistic diseases, and psychosocial problems. Table 14.16 Initial Response to Diagnosis of HIV Reactions to an HIV diagnosis are similar to the reactions of people who are diagnosed with any life-threatening, debilitating, or chronic illness. These reactions include anxiety, panic, fear, depression, denial, hopelessness, anger, and guilt. Unfortunately, all these emotions are overlaid with the stigma and discrimination that continue to infuse societal reactions to HIV. The patient's family members, friends, and caregivers experience many of the same reactions. As time passes, patients and their loved ones will be confronted with complex treatment decisions, feelings of loss, anger, powerlessness, depression, and grief, social isolation, the possibility of death, and or thoughts of suicide. Antiretroviral therapy. ART can significantly slow the progression of HIV. However, treatment regimens can be complex. The drugs have side effects. ART does not work for everyone, and it is expensive. These factors can contribute to problems with adherence to treatment, a dangerous situation because of the high risk for developing drug resistance. Interventions include teaching about 1. Advantages and disadvantages of new treatments, 2. Dangers of poor adherence to therapeutic regimens, 3. How and when to take each drug, 4. Drug interactions to avoid, and 5. Side effects to report to the HCP. Table 14.7 outlines patient and caregiver teaching on HIV treatment and initial follow-up. Clinical guidelines provide information on initial drug regimens. However, one of the most important considerations for initiating therapy is patient readiness for treatment. Adherence to ART is a critical part of successful drug therapy for people with HIV infection. Nurses are uniquely prepared to provide assistance with adherence to the drug regimen, Table 14.18. Taking drugs as prescribed, right dose and time, is important for all drug therapy. But with HIV infection, missing even a few doses can lead to drug resistance. We can help patients adhere to difficult treatment regimens with electronic reminders, beepers, timers on pillboxes, and calendars. Group support and individual counseling can help. The best approach is to learn about the patient's life and assist with problem solving related to taking medications within the confines of that life. Delaying disease progression. Promoting a healthy immune system, whether the patient chooses to take ART or not, may delay the progression of HIV disease. Useful interventions for HIV-infected patients include 1. Getting nutritional support to maintain lean body mass and ensure appropriate levels of vitamins and micronutrients. 
Two, moderating or eliminating alcohol, tobacco, and drug use. Three, keeping up to date with recommended vaccines. Four, getting adequate rest and exercise. Five, reducing stress. Six, avoiding exposure to new infectious agents. Seven, accessing counseling. Eight, getting involved in support groups and community activities. And nine, developing a consistent relationship with HCPs, including attending regular appointments. Teach patients to recognize symptoms that may indicate disease progression and or drug side effects so that prompt medical care can be initiated. Table 14.19 gives an overview of symptoms that patients should report. Acute exacerbations. Acute exacerbations of recurring problems characterize chronic disease. This is especially true in HIV disease in which infections, cancers, debility, and psychosocial or economic issues may interact to overwhelm the patient's ability to cope. Nursing care becomes more complex as the patient's immune system declines and new problems arise to compound existing difficulties. When opportunistic diseases or difficult treatment side effects develop, the patient needs symptom management, teaching, and emotional support. Nursing care can help prevent the many opportunistic diseases associated with HIV infection. The best way to prevent opportunistic disease is to ensure that the patient is adhering to an effective ART regimen, and if appropriate, taking prophylactic medications for opportunistic infections. Should an opportunistic disease occur, nursing care is an essential part of helping the patient adhere to medications and providing supportive care specific to the opportunistic disease. For example, if the patient has pneumocystis girovici pneumonia, PCP, figure 14.18, Nursing interventions can ensure adequate oxygenation. If the patient has cryptococcal meningitis, an important nursing concern is maintaining a safe environment for a confused patient. Ambulatory care. HIV infection has no cure, continues for life, causes physical disability, and contributes to impaired health. In many cases, it can lead to death. HIV infection affects the entire range of a person's life, from physical health to social, emotional, economic, and spiritual well-being. As a nurse, you are often the person who works most closely with patients who are trying to cope with living with HIV. Stigma of HIV HIV-infected patients share problems experienced by all those with chronic diseases. But these problems are worsened by negative social attitudes and beliefs surrounding HIV. HIV-infected people may be thought to lack control over urges to have sex or use IV drugs. Some people conclude that people with HIV brought the disease on themselves and deserve to be sick. Some view behaviors associated with HIV infection as immoral, e.g., homosexuality, promiscuity. Other behaviors are sometimes illegal, e.g. using drugs or sex work. The fact that infected people can transmit HIV to others creates fear, which leads to stigma and discrimination in areas of life. In the United States, HIV-infected people have lost jobs, homes, and insurance, although the American with Disabilities Act, ADA, prohibits these forms of discrimination. HIV-related stigma is a global problem that is often more severe for women. Discrimination can lead to social isolation, dependence, frustration, low self-image, loss of control, and economic pressures. Disease and Drug Side Effects Physical problems related to HIV or its treatment can interfere with the patient's ability to maintain a desired lifestyle. HIV-infected patients often have anxiety, fear, depression, diarrhea, peripheral neuropathy, pain, nausea, vomiting, and fatigue. Nursing interventions for these symptoms are similar to what they would be for the patient who does not have HIV infection. For example, nursing management of diarrhea includes helping patients collect specimens, recommending diet changes, encouraging fluid and electrolyte replacement, teaching the patient about skin care, and managing skin breakdown around the perianal area. 
Nursing approaches for fatigue in HIV include teaching patients to assess fatigue patterns, determine contributing factors, set activity priorities, conserve energy, schedule rest periods, exercise regularly, and avoid substances such as caffeine, nicotine, alcohol, and other drugs that may disturb sleep. Some HIV-infected patients, especially those who have been infected and on ART for a long time, may develop a set of metabolic disorders. These include, one, lipodystrophy, changes in the body shape caused by a redistribution of fat in the abdomen, upper back and breasts, along with fat loss in the arms, legs, and face, figure 14.9. Two, hyperlipidemia, high triglycerides, high low-density lipoproteins, and decreased high-density lipoproteins. Three, insulin resistance. Four, hyperglycemia. Five, bone disease, osteoporosis, osteopenia, and avascular necrosis. Six, lactic acidosis. Seven, renal disease and eight, cardiovascular disease. It is still not clear why these disorders develop, but it is likely a combination of factors, such as long-term infection with HIV, side effects of ART, genetic predisposition, and chronic stress. Management of metabolic disorders focuses on detecting problems early, dealing with symptoms, and helping the patient cope with emerging problems and changes to treatment regimens. It is important to recognize and treat these problems early, especially because cardiovascular disease and lactic acidosis are potentially fatal complications. A frequent first intervention is to change ART medications because some drugs are more associated with those disorders. Lipid abnormalities are generally treated with lipid-lowering drugs. See Table 33.6 diet changes, and exercise. Insulin resistance is treated with hypoglycemic drugs and weight loss. Exercise, diet changes, and calcium and vitamin D supplements may improve bone disease. End of life care. Despite new developments in the treatment of HIV infection, many patients eventually have disease progression, disability, and death. Sometimes these occur because treatments do not work for the patient. Sometimes the patient's HIV becomes resistant to all available drug therapies. In addition, ART is now allowing people living with HIV to live longer and to develop diseases of aging, such as cardiovascular and endocrine problems that lead to death. Nursing care during the terminal phase of any disease should focus on keeping the patient comfortable facilitating emotional and spiritual acceptance of the finite nature of life, helping the patient's significant others deal with grief and loss, and maintaining a safe environment. As a nurse, you are the pivotal care provider during this phase of illness, whether at home, through hospice, or in a health care facility. End-of-life care is discussed in Chapter 9. Evaluation the expected outcomes are that the patient at risk for HIV infection will develop and implement a personal plan to decrease personal risk factors, have testing for HIV. The expected outcomes are that the patient with HIV infection will adhere to treatment for HIV disease, work with the healthcare team to achieve optimal health, and prevent transmission of HIV to others. Gerontologic considerations, HIV infection. The number of older adults who have HIV disease is increasing because one, HIV treatment has been effective in reducing the number of deaths from HIV-related opportunistic infections, and two, people 60 and older are being infected at increasing rates. The number of people over the age of 60 living with HIV is expected to grow. Remember that older people living with HIV are susceptible to the same diseases as non-HIV infected older people. These include heart disease, cancer, diabetes, bone disease, arthritis, hypertension, kidney disease, and cognitive impairment. However, people with HIV infection may develop these diseases at an earlier age compared with non-HIV infected people. 
and be at higher risk for comorbidities related to ART. For example, some HIV medications are associated with increased lipids and altered insulin metabolism. Focusing nursing care on early identification of these complications and helping patients reduce their risk for heart disease, diabetes, or other chronic disease are critical aspects of caring for the older HIV patient. The impact of polypharmacy is another consideration with the aging HIV population. In general, older adults take multiple medications to manage various chronic diseases. Some medications may interact with or be potentiated by HIV medications. Therefore, careful monitoring and assessment of possible drug interactions is important when providing care to the population. Older adults may be ashamed and hesitate to tell anyone that they have an HIV infection. This may make it hard for them to get the appropriate health care and support. As a nurse, you need to recognize that HIV will affect an increasing number of older adults and be prepared to help the older person who is living with HIV infection.